Good evening, welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore. We're so pleased to welcome Atticus Lish to our At Home with Literati series in support of the War for Gloria and in conversation this evening with author Scott McClanahan. Just a quick overview for our attendees of our webinar features. Uh, that if you're just joining us, the chat is closed, but you can keep the chat window open as I will be dropping links to purchase War for Gloria from Literati throughout the event. You can use the Q&A feature on your toolbar to submit questions at any time, and I will ask a selection at the conclusion of our conversation. Um, live transcription is available on your toolbar as well as a CC icon below, should you need that. And of course, if you're watching us later on YouTube, um, be sure to check the description below for links to purchase books from our store. Um, and don't forget to like and subscribe to make sure you stay current with all of our At Home with Literati events as they become available on our YouTube channel. And as a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And if you live in Southeast Michigan, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. Most of all, we'd just like to thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, uh, or later this evening, depending on when and where in the world uh, you may be joining us from. So without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's author and our moderator. Atticus Lish is the author of Preparation for the Next Life, which won the 2015 Penn and Faulkner Award for Fiction and the 2016 Grand Prix de Literature Américaine. And Scott McClanahan is the author of the Sarah book, Crapalachia and Hill William, he lives in Beckley, West Virginia. Please welcome Atticus Lish and Scott McClanahan into your living rooms. Oh, good to be here. Hey, hi, Scott. Hey, how are you doing, Atticus? Uh, did you want to go ahead and read now then to get started, or do you want to kind of come back uh, to that? Or Well, reading now would be fine. I, okay. Before I get started, I just want to say I really am glad to be here, and thanks to Literati, and thanks to John for the introduction. And again, thank you to you, Scott. Uh, I don't know if people out there will know, but uh, I've known of you for a long time and I'm glad to finally put a face to the name. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna read from the first chapter of The War for Gloria. This chapter is called Woman, Earth, Sun, and Richard Feynman. You never think about nerves and breathing. You take breathing for granted. You take the nerves under your skin or under the skin of another animal for granted. His mother loved him. Gloria said, you make me laugh. He had a sense of humor about their lives, apparently. She was a single mother and he helped her collect her library off the streets of Boston and never complained about it. They went through crates of books together and shared what they found. Her boy was never bored, even living in her car. She came from Springfield, which she called her shitty little city. She had come to Boston to go to college. She wanted to stand on the shoulders of Jermaine Greer, the author of Sex and Destiny. She gave birth to Corey at Mass General during what should have been her final year of college. She crashed in Cleveland Circle Jamaica Plain, Mission Hill, just her and her son and her ever-changing roommates. For a time, they stayed at a triple-decker house in Dorchester and he went to school where a good half the other kids were from the Cape Verde Islands. Corey showed his mom the islands on the map, Boa Vista and Santiago off the coast of Senegal, telling her that he'd be sailing here someday when he grew up and went to sea. He had learned about the concept of a vessel from living in his mother's car. He had fastened on the concept early. Maybe it was always in his head, one of the basic concepts he was born with, woman, earth, sun, boat. Her full name was Gloria Goltz. In his mind, she was always a bright blonde. He saw her as having a glass jaw that she kept putting up and it kept getting cracked. But when it came to him, she was stalwart. Once, she took him to a KFC, and the manager didn't want to give her another biscuit with her order. But she demanded it, because Corey loved biscuits. He had read 
that sailors ate hardtack and salt pork. And the manager, with his thin arms and striped shirt, relented. Mom, you're always giving me things. You never ask for anything. Gloria and Corey cut the biscuits on their brown plastic tray and had them with butter and honey. Will you mind it when I become a sailor? Oh no, but I want you to be a smart sailor. I don't want you to be dumb. But will you mind it when I have to leave home? I'll have to accept it. I'll come back and visit. Voyages usually take about three years. Whaling voyages can take seven. There was a pattern between them of her getting blue and of him helping her. She got blue because of herself. She had not fulfilled the ambition she'd had at 17, smoking a cigarette in front of her concrete dorm building at Leslie College in the shadow of Harvard, in the literal shadow of its tombstone-shaped, ivy-covered law library, to think and write and shock the world, to condemn it, to synthesize all the available evidence, art, history, movies, negative images and messages in the media, her upbringing, her body in the mirror, her own thoughts, even the smallest things down to the cigarette in her mouth, into a single scream of rage against the patriarchy. Instead, she'd been a waitress, a barmaid, taking bottles off a counter after the bar was closed and the band was unplugging its amps and it was too late to do anything but sleep the next day away. And this had gone on for years, years of telling herself that she was finding her voice, that she was getting ready, years of reading, not writing, of groggy afternoons, a feminist book in her hands on the tea, Sex and Destiny, Doc Martens on her feet, reading at the Auburn pan, jumping up from her wire chair and standing on the red leather toes of her boots to hug the street musicians who drifted in with the pigeons, carrying guitars, wearing bowler hats and German army trench coats, the wet stink of the bathroom around the corner and the weird men playing chess all day, the hobos from Seattle, skinheads in suspenders saluting in the street, a dyed mohawk the size of a circular saw blade from a lumber mill atop a gaunt, bald head, kids from the wealthy towns of Concord and Lexington exploring new identities as bitter waifs, at night a wolf pack of multiracial youths from Dorchester, one a white boy wearing a shirt saying that funky Cypress Hills shit there to sell drugs, her skinny legs. She had dropped out of school. She had hung out in the pit at Harvard Square, sitting cross-legged in striped tights on the granite wall, her eyes mascaraed, her mouth painted black, debating with her fellow anarchists, giving the finger to the square, the bank, the bricks, the coop, the clock, the privilege, and hypocrisy. The scream of rage was at herself. So sometimes as the years passed, she'd look at herself and the weight of the time and the evidence of who she was would hit her and she'd get high and ask, will it ever be okay? And for some reason, her son would tell her, hey mom, don't be sad. You're great. You're greater than you know. Thank you. Thank you, Atticus. Uh, uh, that specific chapter, I guess, one of the things that uh, made me think as you were reading there, uh, were you a fan of uh, Richard Feynman growing up? Well, no, I don't think I really knew who Richard Feynman was. Um, I, I mean, maybe I'd heard of him, but um, no, I, I couldn't say I was a, a fan of his. Uh, not by any stretch, no. Yeah, because yeah, uh, I think there's uh, the only book of his that I've read is, uh, I think the Modern Library put out an edition of it. Uh, it was in the 1990s when Modern Library were doing those fancy hardcovers. I think it's called 12 Easy Pieces, uh, I believe. And it's, and it's him, you know, breaking down uh, you know, these various problems and looking at it, you know, from, a, from an artistic sort of sense. And I just, I just made me wonder, even as I was reading through the, reading through the book uh, last week, if, uh, if you were a Feynman fan. Um, well, I, I'm sorry, I, I was going to say I could easily become a Feynman fan. He really is such an interesting character that, you know, the books that I saw of his, I, 
I did come across the 12 easy pieces, but I don't think I really read it. I, there are two books called Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, or something uh -huh. like that. And I think I saw them on a friend's shelf. And then later when I was writing this book, I discovered them on that I had them too. And then there's also a biography of uh, Feynman called Genius by James Glick. And uh -huh. um, I, I, I happen to have that, but it have never really made my way all the way through it. Yeah. Uh, another thing that makes me think of, we're going to bore the audience here with me asking about books. Uh, but uh, with this, with all of this, you know, Corey wanting to be, you know, a sailor and being interested in, uh, you know, things of a, of a nautical nature. Have you ever read a book called Two Years Before the Mast? by Richard Henry Dana. I read that previous to reading The War with Gloria, and it just kind of popped into my head that there was, um, I don't know, not necessarily similarities, but, uh, you know, a kid trying to find himself for sure. I'll go ahead and let you answer. Now, I was just going to say, I mean, there is a connection there with Richard Henry Dana was a Harvard graduate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think he got the measles. Isn't that the reason why he goes to sea? I think he believed he got the measles. So his eyes, he was having problems with his eyes, wasn't able to keep up with the schoolwork. And then he decides that he's going to, you know, join this uh, sailing venture that takes him away from home for two years. I want to say that that's true, that I read that in his Wikipedia. I would defer to you. I, it's been so long since I read the book, but I, um, I think about the book. You know, I, I've read a lot of, I was very interested in the sea when I was younger. And so the books that I read that were about maritime adventures, I tend to keep in a file in the back of my head. Yeah, yeah. It was one of those books, you know, you, I, I've seen it countless times. My father-in-law has mentioned it to me before, and it was just something in terms of my reading that had just completely fallen by the wayside. And I was like, I'm going to read two years before the mass. And it's amazing. It's an amazing book like Melville. You can, you can just see the places in the text where Melville is kind of pulling from it. Uh, you know, him himself. There's even a passage in uh, Melville's Redburn, I believe, where one of the characters says, you know, if you want to, you want to read a book about sailing, you need to read two years before the mast. It's an Alana dialogue that he, that he has. Th that amazes me. I never would have connected Richard Henry Dana to Melville. At yeah. First of all, now you got me excited. I really want to reread it. Yeah, yeah, you should go back to it. I, I the edition that I had, it had him returning 20 years later. So there was like an appendix that was included with the edition that I had. He goes back to California 20 years after the voyage. And that's what turned it into, you know, a next level sort of sort of book for me, because he even talks about the way that California changed within a relatively short period of time, you know, between 1836 and 1856. It's a completely different world out there from, you know, what he had what he'd experienced. Huh. Yeah. I, I am definitely going to want to look that up because I have returned to California 20 years later myself. You know, yeah. I another reason I lived here uh, around, around 2000 and I just moved back here. So now you got, gave me a, another reason. <laughs> yeah. then, there's, then there's the whole thing with Melville. I did read Melville while writing this and I, um, I, I, I read word for word everything in Moby Dick, which I hadn't done before. I, I'd done what everybody, I guess, does, which is read the very beginning, and then yeah. you kind of know the end. But I actually made it all the way through Moby Dick, loved it, appreciated it. I also read a little bit of Tai... I'm going to get it wrong. Is it Taipei? Tai, it's Taipei. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A little South Sea Adventure, and that was hair-raising. Yeah, I think the earliest books, because I think those are the books where you can see Melville really pulling from Richard Henry Dana. Those early Melville books, you know, Typey, Umu, uh, I can't remember the third one off the top of my head. You know, those books are just amazing, just in that how modern the narrative feels, because it is almost just kind of straight narrative. He's just telling you these events, uh, these events that are uh, occurring. So, so that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing I was going to ask you, and... Um, is, you know, with, you know, having a first novel that's, you know, such a, such a success, um, would you explain a little bit about, I don't know, the journey from the first book to uh, The War for Gloria? Yes, I, I would be happy to. Um, 
I completed uh, the first novel in in I think 2013, and there was a there was a layoff of a year where the book was getting our mutual acquaintance, John Carlo, the late John Carlo was, was preparing the book for publication. And so during that year, um, I, I, I wasn't actively writing a new book, but I was thinking I would want to write something. And I went from one idea to another. I had a bunch of crazy ideas. And um, I remember uh, kind of fantasizing that I would write a book about Afghanistan. Uh, and then thinking, well, to really do justice to the subject, I'd have to go to Afghanistan. And it just seemed like um, uh, more of a commitment than I uh, was really wanted to make at that point. Um, so, I, I, so I was thinking about what to do next. Then when, it, well, I, let, let me be a little bit more clear about that. What I was actually thinking about in relation to Afghanistan was this, I love thrillers by a guy named Andy McNabb, who is a, um, I think that's the pen name, the pseudonym of a former British uh, military man who fought mm. in Gulf One and was famously captured uh, by the Republican Guard, uh, the Iraqi public Republican Guard, yeah. um, tortured, forced to um, uh, do unpleasant things and, uh, and then went on with his life and, and wrote a ton of military thrillers. He was in the uh, famous Bravo 2-0 uh, incident. Um, that was the name of his, the call sign of his elite unit. So anyway, I've been reading his thrillers for years and they go all around the world. Uh, and several of them take place, at least a couple of them take place in Afghanistan. And I don't remember the title of it, but I, but one of them went into a subject that did interest me, which was, um, I guess you would call it human trafficking. I, Afghanistan has a long history of a, uh, of, uh, uh, mistreating its, its, its women folk. I, the, uh, you know, you'll have a, a guy who's older than me married to an 11 year old girl or something. And there's such a difference in, uh, in, in strength and, and power, you, it's not surprising that transgressions occur and that people get uh, treated terribly. And the, you hear reports of brides setting themselves on fire because they can't take it and things like that. Well, it's in that context that Andy McNabb's book takes place and um, that there are uh, women in the chaos of uh, the, uh, the warfare now that was then raging and you know, there's just been news about it, of course, uh, the, the U.S. withdrawal, but raging in Afghanistan. And so uh, his hero goes to really rescue uh, uh, essentially a brothel, a wartime brothel to, uh, to, to free the women there. Um, I thought, and you could see the connection to the themes of preparation for the next life. I thought that would be right up my alley. I felt that that would be something I'd like to do. I mean, my original character in prep was really from Central Asia. And I thought, what about her story taking place right there at ground zero in Central Asia? And um, so I played with that idea, but never executed it. Lo and behold, prep came out. Um, and I knew it was go time, time to write a new book. And I re gave up any thought of the, um, the, the Afghanistan book. And I asked myself, what was closest to the bone for me personally, uh, assuming I couldn't just fly around the world looking for a story. So I looked in and when I looked inside, uh, I saw that I really did have something left to say. There was something that did trouble me. It was the story of my mother's death. Uh, and that was what gave rise to the premise of the War for Gloria. Yeah, yeah. Um, how did you meet John Carlo? I met John Carlo uh, at a New York West Side bar called Bar Nine. I was, I believe, I was in. Well, now, here's what happened. I went out to dinner with my father and a couple of other people. My father, Gordon Lish, if anybody yeah. doesn't know, knew. Uh, my father's an editor. Uh, and writer, and he knew John Carlo. And I was out to dinner with, with Gordon, and he took me afterwards and introduced me to John Carlo. And I want to say it was 2007 or eight. 
Oh gosh. Yeah. Yes. See, that's even that's even earlier than than my you know knowing him. So yeah. Huh. huh. Yeah. I, uh, I well, I think I have the dates right. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe no. Was... You might you might be right. You might be right because I I know that I know that he's you know he's you know spoke about you you know for quite a while even before you know the book uh, you know preparations for the next life next life came out and I've always just kind of wondered how you two met. Well, I the we met in the real subject that got started was I did goofy drawings and I was going to mention that yeah yeah. Yeah, Cause, that was... cause, yeah, because I'm a huge fan of. I think my wife is as well. Uh, I think we have three copies because uh, Gian, I think he put it out a couple of different times in different sort of formats of uh, your book. You know, life is with people. Because one of my questions was going to be, do you still do you still draw? Yes, I do. Yes, yeah. I do. Yeah, yeah, because it's an amazing book, and I oftentimes wonder too that. Um, you know, there's almost a strange narrative that also happens uh, in that in that book. I was wondering, you know, if you if you felt like your writing was influenced in any way by your drawing, if that question makes any sense. Sure. Yeah. What I I, I can answer it this way. Um, during the struggle to write the War for Gloria, a time came when I realized I hadn't drawn for a long time. And also whenever I would draw something, I, so I began to do a little sketching at that point or draw a little uh, goofy cartoon to entertain myself and also to see if I still had the ability because I'd just been laboring at Gloria for a long time, uh, getting lost, not knowing how to resolve the book. So I tried drawing and I started to notice that what I drew was stereotyped. It was muscle memory. I, I, I it, completely unconsciously, I would draw a face or a figure and realize that I'd drawn it before. I'd recognize it. I would think this is a problem because uh, there's nothing new here. Uh, this isn't really art. This is just a Xerox machine. So I made an effort to begin to draw from life. I drew my own hand, I drew my foot. Um, and, uh, and so I went through an effort to um, start at the beginning and, and reproduce things as I saw them, which was a new exercise for me. Now, I do believe that I felt I was learning something that I could then apply to writing because, you could, because I could see right there physically in black and white how something would be wrong and messy before it was smooth and elegant. And that should have taught me, I hope it teaches me to remember, you go from a rough draft to, an, to, a, to finished carpentry, to an edited version. You don't start with something beautiful and polished. You don't put the cart before the horse. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh one thing that I guess that is just of interest to me, I'm not exactly sure if it'll be of interest to anyone out there, but I was just like for you, what's your writing day like typically? Uh, do, you, do you type or do you write by hand or what's your typical day like? Well, um, what, I, what I do to produce new material is I write by hand. And the great thing about that is it's portable. I can take a notebook with me and I can work from life, you know, I can, or at least be outside where there's human beings. Um, so um, then a stage will come, and it may not happen the very same day, but a stage will come where I have to go from the rough carpentry to the finished carpentry. I have to go from the rough sketch to a more polished uh, image. And for that, I use the word processor. I put what I have from the notebook and transcribe it into the word processor. And then um, uh, I will um, uh, print it out and mark it up and, uh, and then uh, polish and, and rewrite. And, uh, and then I usually let it sit a little bit and then I come back and see if it, oh, and another thing is if you're writing a longer piece like a novel, then I, I put it into the book and, and then it's like holding a color swatch up onto your wall. 
to see if it actually works, right? So I'll take, you know, I've got everything else here and I'll stick the new section in and I'll read it together and see if it goes. And that's when I find out usually, you know, it doesn't usually the first time. And then you got to rinse and repeat and go through the whole cycle again. Now, I haven't just described to you what I do in a single day, but more like a process that may take a while. Uh, so the actual um, schedule for a day can vary. Uh, but the main format for a long, long time with Gloria was um, since I had most of the material that I was working with already written, it was... It, it, it was that um, working at a computer, printing out and editing, polishing and seeing if things fit. Because most of the stuff that I did freehand was already done. Most of the raw material that I built the book out of was, was already there. Hmm. Are, you, are, you a, are you a pencil guy? Are you a, you a ballpoint pen guy? I'm, I have my pen right here. This is the type of pen that I always use. This is, um, I've got- I about, recognize it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a pilot, uh, precise. I get the smallest uh, um, uh, point size that's available, the V5. Uh, I get them at, you know, the drugstore and I, and I just keep buying them. I, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's the way I feel too. Like the cheaper the pen, like the, like the better, off, better off it'll be, you know, bomb and, bomb and bull. <laughs> Exactly. Um, I don't want to feel like the pen is. Yeah, exactly. Because I, I, I don't want to feel like the pen is so damn precious. If I lose it, it's a problem. Yeah, of course. Of course. Uh, you've mentioned, you know, the, the drafts that you kind of uh, went through uh, with the with the new book. You know, I always kind of feel like that there are like new things that you uh, that you end up learning or that you kind of end up, you know, teaching yourself. Uh, as you as you work on a new book or as you draft a new book, um, maybe could you describe a little bit more the the maybe problems or issues that you had in some of the earlier drafts, and then what you felt like you you learned at the end of you know completion of uh, completion of the novel. Yes, um, the the biggest problem with the book was its conception. I had a dual conception from the beginning, like a double yoked egg. Um, I, on the one hand, I was going to the subject uh, that um, was a, a coming of age subject, in, in my case, my mother's illness, um, uh, events that occurred when I was a, a, a teenager. Um, and um, on the other hand, I imported a, a, a crime thriller. Uh, more than a crime thriller, uh, I would say um, I was I was trying to do, um, well, I, I guess you could, it's, it's something like Silence of the Lambs. I mean, you know, I wanted to um, I wanted to write something that was um, uh, the closest model that comes to mind was uh, a true crime book uh, that I just absolutely loved, and um, it's called People Who Eat Darkness. Oh yeah, I know that book. I've read that book. It's an amazing book. Yeah. Right. Right, it, it's incredible. I, I, yeah. So I, I had just read it and I thought, boy, I'd like to do something like that. And so I thought, well, here's a chance to do both. And um, this caused me no end of trouble because uh, what I really had in my hand was a drama and uh, the, the, the whole true crime thing just simply didn't go with it, it, it because you know, if you have a drama, you have to see what the characters will do, I find, not fit their actions into, um, well, you know, you know, to, to imitate a true crime book, I would have had to make everything atmospheric. At least that's how I was going about it. Everything had to be chilling. I mean, that's what makes, for me, that's what makes People Who Eat Darkness so good. The, you know, the, the, the most straightforward exposition of the characters' lives uh, each thing has like a touch of chill to it. Like somebody's tapping a, the wrong key on a piano. It's, it's a hell of a job, but I couldn't do that and do the other thing at the same time. I, so this caused me to bang my head against the wall literally for years. And as we sit here talking in that other room, I have tubs, those sterilite tubs that, are, that hold 33 gallons, tubs of paper, tubs, I couldn't lift it all at once. I guarantee you, I couldn't. It, it's got to be two thousand pounds of paper or something. I don't know uh, of drafts that I spewed out trying to make these two stories go together. Finally, in the summer of 
uh, in July of 2020, my editor, uh, Jordan Pavlin, came back and looked at my most recent version and said, look, you know, you've pulled something off here. You've managed to marry these two stories together, but really, uh, they, if you have the stamina for it, you should, you should consider cutting one away and freeing the drama that's actually there. I followed her advice, and the, I felt that the book came together at that point. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I think it does. I think it does it really well too. I believe I saw in you know a, a Paris Review uh, interview with you where you were talking about you know these these separate sort of books uh, that you had at uh, that you had at one point in time. Um, when you have such a such such a success with the with the first book, did you feel any pressure uh, as you were as you were working on uh, you know a, a second book after you know a legendary first novel? I, I felt tremendous pressure, uh, not merely because of um, imagined uh, eyes in the public on me, um, but uh, also because. Uh, um, I think I felt that I was, I'll spit it out and just say it. I think I felt that I was doing battle with uh, my progenitor and um, that I had once and for all taken up a duel with him. I felt that my honor was at stake, really for all those factors. I also felt that my livelihood, my possibility of a future career was at stake. I felt like all the chips were on the table. And of course, that did not help me relax and do the job. I, I was, um, I got a little tense. Yeah, um, you, you've you've continued with the third person with uh, this the second novel. Uh, I guess maybe one question I want to know is, what is it about the third person that you that you love? Um, you know, as a novelist, and then maybe the second question as well is. Do you feel that your prose style has shifted uh, in any way from between the first book uh, and the and the second second book? Maybe explain that a little bit if you could. Yes, I. Um, so your first question was, what do I like about the third person? Yeah, what do you like about the third person? Yeah, I, uh, I because it's the third person because it keeps me away from me. I think that there are several reasons that um, I mean this book. It, draws on autobiographical material, but it also doesn't. It's it, at the end of the day, it is fiction. And um, I was perfectly willing to change circumstances to fit what the story was. The, um, I, I don't want to make myself the subject of attention. Um, I think this was a pretty conscious decision when I began to write for, in 2008 when I wrote the first book and I and I can intend to stick with it. The reason is possibly that I saw my father doing that. I think I had contempt for it. I felt it wasn't the right subject. I felt it was narcissistic. And now that may or may not really be true and there may be many ways to slice that particular uh, topic. But that was how I felt. And, uh, and who knows what else underlies it? Perhaps um, uh, maybe, you know, fear of exposing too much of myself could also be a possibility. That's possible. But I made a decision early on. Look, I, here's what I said to myself. I said, I admired journalists. I admired journalistic authors. I read an essay by Tom Wolfe. First, I read Tom Wolfe. Then I read an essay by Tom Wolfe in which he uh, defends Richard Price uh, uh, and um, or, or lionizes Richard Price uh, rightfully, I think, for writing Clockers, which is essentially a journalistic novel about uh, drug dealing. And um, and and he connect. Wolf connects what uh, Price does to uh, the work of Dickens, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky. But, well, yeah, Stephen Crane. Yeah, he loves those journalist writers. Yeah, who are just going out and reporting, seeing it with their own eyes. Yeah, there it is. I or and as Wolf put it, giving the reader a window into uh, a world that they might may not know. Now, Wolf wrote that essay in reaction to being attacked by Norman Mailer and some other people who accused him of, uh, of, of not really doing literature. I loved Wolf's attack. 
and I think I imagined that my father would have been in Mailer's camp on that particular uh, subject, that my father would have felt that, uh, uh, that uh, it, it isn't truly literary. And I also suspected that that attack um, was uh, motivate, would have been motivated by poor self-esteem on Gordon's part, that really deep down, if you were honest, you could not but admire Tom Wolfe for writing the right stuff, which is not fiction, but still, yeah. or, you know, um, say a man in full. So um, I said, I want to be like Tom Wolf. That's what kind of what I was thinking. I want to be, you know, I want to be like Tolstoy. I told myself uh, megalomaniacally. I, but really what that is, isn't so much megalomania as if you're in the fight game, you would want to fight the guy at the top of the division. You may never get there, but that's who you think about. So that was why I positioned myself in the third person. Now, as to your other question, did my style change when I wrote the second book? I think I allowed it to be a little less plain style, and I went a little smarter sounding um, uh, or cooler sounding or uh, because I felt it could give that chilly atmospheric effect that I had encountered in um, uh, people who eat darkness in which I admired so much. It was, you know, um, uh, but once I realized the book that I was actually writing, I think I settled down and that, um, that, that kind of um, uh, condensed style may have uh, relaxed a little bit. And I, certainly right now I've gone plain again. Uh, and I think it's the way to go. I, the pro stylist I admire most right now is Richard Grant, who's uh, a nonfiction writer who's uh, maybe similar in style to Sebastian Younger. Okay, all right. Uh, what was it that you liked about Tolstoy? Um, well, uh, I love two books most of all, uh, Haji Murad and The Cossacks. Um, but the the dirty secret is I can't get through War and Peace, and maybe I don't love Tolstoy as much as I wished I loved Tolstoy. Yeah, well, there's all that French stuff in the first few, that first chapter of War and Peace, you know, <laughs> where the Russian nobility speak in French. That's it's so difficult to like get through that 30 pages. Of, I believe it's just in some ways maybe kind of a, pra a practical thing that he distances. Uh, the the reader kind of early on. One thing you know, you mentioned uh, you mentioned uh, you know fighting. Um, you know, I, and maybe this is connected to Tolstoy uh, as well. Um, do you do you feel that there's that there is some sort of uh, connection between? I don't know. Is is a good writer also probably a a good athlete, or at least have the mindset of a of a good athlete, or is it different? I really don't think the two have to go together by any stretch. Um, uh, they certainly better not in my case. Uh, but um, I, I, I think it's natural to want to use, I mean, writing's abstract. So it's nice to want a physical, to have a physical metaphor for what you're doing. Um, uh, we may have a, um, a, a mutual uh, acquaintance uh, possibly uh, in um, Bud Smith. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if Bud Smith might on occasion compare his writing to, well, maybe other people do it for him. They say they might want to say, well, you know, his writing is something like the heavy construction that he does. Um, I, you know, I, if, you always want a physical metaphor for, for writing because the, I think because the maddening thing about it is um, otherwise it, um, uh, you don't have anything to hold on to. Um, you know, what is it exactly? I mean, how do you push yourself? How do you, um, uh, um, how do you, uh, right. So anyway, uh, but to answer, but I think that metaphor could be anything and, and it also yeah. doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, with your first book, Preparations for the Next Life, you know, being put out by a small press and now, you know, the new novel but being, being put out, you know, by, you know, one of the majors, right? Um, has the process, I, I guess, even just in publishing, have, did, did you see a distinct difference between the two or did it make you nostalgic for the days of 2011, 2012 or? Well, the, the big difference between the, the, what was the first book I really wrote without any um, 
press at all. I mean, I, I didn't know John, John Carlo and I didn't discuss that I was writing a book. He was the one guy in publishing I really knew. Um, nobody knew I was writing the book. So, uh, so when I wrote Prep, um, there was, uh, I only had myself to please. I only had myself looking over my own shoulder. Yeah. That was the big difference. I, I have never had the experience of um, a book contract for a small house versus writing a book while I having a book contract for a big house. So it's not, a, it's a little bit apples and oranges. It was just total anonymity and no pressure, but also uh, no, no hope of, in fact, I didn't even know that I would get prep published. That's another thing. Once I got the book done, I had no idea how to get it published. And I only had, I hadn't even talked to John Carlo in a long time. And I had no idea if he'd had room for it, if he liked it. I, I mean, I just thought I'll cross that bridge when I finish the goddamn thing. Once I, get, you know, so that it was very different knowing that I was under contract uh, while writing the second one. Very different, yeah. just because um, uh, for obvious reasons. Yeah, was the editorial sort of process any different, or I guess what I'm asking you, I'm prompting you to talk about maybe Giancarlo's uh, editing, if possible. Well, the uh, Giancarlo barely touched the book. And that was uh, a great relief to me because um, I was, and for a long time have been overly touchy about anybody interfering with my writing, oh, my precious writing. I probably got that way because of familial reasons. When I was growing up, my father was a very harsh critic of things that I wrote when I was a pretty little kid. And I think for a time, beat the writing out of me. And it was, uh, I years ago, I was asked essentially this question by a journalist, you know, were you running away from something all those years you didn't write? You know, maybe, maybe I was, I, I, I had to claw my way back to, to, um, uh, to write the, to write prep. Um, uh, against the uh, loss of confidence uh, that I think was, um, that I think I carried with me from youth. But, you know, that could also just be, be me. I, I think it runs in the family on the other side of the family, a kind of self-lacerating, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, perfectionism combined with a, a lack of confidence. You know, if you look at um, Axl Rose versus Slash, you know, Slash looks like he just plays and gets better all the time and enjoys what he does and looks like a low stress guy, relatively speaking, whereas Axl Rose is in the studio forever and ever and ever trying to do Chinese democracy. In Axl Rose, I see a little bit something similar to my mother. My mother was an art, uh, a commercial artist, and she mm -hmm. would kill herself over her work. And she'd be awake at three o'clock in the morning and there were, she was agonized over it. While writing, I've often felt that I'm in her, uh, that I'm very much her son because I've done the same thing. Oh, okay. But, um, I believe we're getting up to 745, but I have one more question before we uh, flip over to audience uh, questions. And I think that, you know, I'd read uh, a couple years ago, there's an interview that you did with uh, Lauren Euler when the first book came out and you said you had this ambition uh, to try to write 20 novels. Uh, and I was wonder, wondering if that's still the goal, if that's still the ambition. No, my ambition now is just to keel over and die. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, the reason I said that, I think I've always admired people. It, it's exactly the last question. I've admired people who can just cut loose and let it rip, who can really produce. And I think I admired that so much because I wrestled like my mother did with my own perfectionism, which gave me a case of lockjaw. And I didn't want to go down in silence, never having sung my song, danced my dance. I wanted to be somebody who's just a little more mellow and just lets it go. So I've, I think that may be really why I like Tolstoy, just because of the sheer volume. I've yeah. always admired quantity over quality. Yeah, here recently in the... Was a joke. Yeah, in the past few years, I've uh, started reading Balzac, you know, the French writer, who was another missing part of, you know, my reading. Um, and 
it feels freeing almost to read those 19th century novels. They're, they're not like so obsessed with the way the sentence sounds and the way the sentence looks. You know, I'm sure Balzac got to the end of one of those novels and he couldn't even remember what his first sentence was. Uh, and there, and there's something really beautiful, you know, about that 19th century work ethic because, you know, you have publication, you know, waiting on you the next day uh, or, or whatever. Well, I'll never forget on that point, Melville saying in Moby Dick, this is just a rough draft. This is just a rough draft of a rough draft. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I don't know exactly. Uh, John, are you going to uh, pop here's in John. here? And, all right, excellent. Here I am. Uh, we don't have any questions yet from our viewers, but I will remind them that uh, if you have a question for Atticus Lewis, you can submit it using the Q&A feature uh, at the bottom of your screen. But Scott, I'm happy to, to turn it back over to you. In the meantime, if you have uh, additional questions, you didn't get a chance to ask Atticus or, or any uh, points you'd like to return to, and I'll return either when we have a question or I have a question of my own or yeah, if, do you uh, have a question of your own, John? You want well, to I have, I mean, I have, the, I have my stock uh, bookseller question, uh, which is kind of sh shameless. And it's just always uh, asking authors to talk about what they're reading currently uh, as a means wanna, to, yeah, I want to know that too. So that's a great, great. question. Sure. So I'd, I'd love to have you both mention what, what you're currently reading and enjoying uh, and I will do my best to uh, furiously drum up links for our attendees as well uh, to those books uh, at our website. Well, um, I have just finished Victoria Shore's The Plum Trees and loved it. Uh, that's a book about the death camps. Um, and um, I, that's great. Um, Earlier in the year, I listened on Audible to the rise and fall of the Third Reich. If you think there's a theme here, I'm about to break it. I, I, I would say the rise and fall of the Third Reich is terrific. Um, and uh, it may be huge. There may be a lot of volume like we were talking about, but uh, it's not boring. Um, what, I'm, what I'm reading now um, um, is... Um, I've been I've been trying to go through uh, David Copperfield, and uh, in in fits and starts. So. I guess I'm next. Then, uh, well, I guess one book I've, uh, after finishing uh, the Richard Henry Dana, there's another I guess, strange Harvard boy called Francis Parkman, uh, who is kind of the father of American historians. I've been reading his book, The Oregon Trail, which I'm not liking as much. Uh, is two years before the mass, but it's a it's another I guess we could say kind of nineteenth century memoir about uh, about travel and him, him going uh, going west. I kind of discovered him as a historian in the last year or so, and I really ch I went through quite a few of his uh, you know histories. He's interested in uh, France uh, in North America, and he deals with uh, he deals with that that history. Uh, but one of probably the most entertaining. I read recently was uh, Francis Wilson's biography of uh, D.H. Lawrence uh, that's called Burning Man. Francis Wilson's a great, one of our great living uh, biographers, and uh, it's a it's a great uh, it's a great biography, especially if you're a D.H. Lawrence nut like I am, or you like the life maybe a little bit more than the writing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, but Scott, I'm happy to, to turn it back to you maybe for, for our last question of the night and, and uh, I'll jump back on if, if, if we do have a brave audience member who, who submits a question in the meantime. Okay, all right. I mean, I guess we could kind of, uh, you know, continue along with what we've, uh, what we've finished up with. Do you, are you working on, I know it's horrible when another writer asks you this question, but do you, do you already know the path? Uh, that that you want to go down with uh, with the next one, and you know, are you are you going down that path as we speak? Uh, no, I um, I'm writing an article uh, to cover the Jake Paul Tyron Woodley fight right now, and so um, I I kind of am a one thing at a time person, and but I'll be done soon, I hope, and then I'll uh, tackle the, the the next book. Yeah. Would you would you be are, are you interested in journalism? Would you be open to doing, you know, a nonfiction, a nonfiction book like, you know, Tom Wolfe, as you as you mentioned? Well, um, I think this, the, the strategy that I would follow for now 
would be uh, to be open to doing uh, smaller work that's nonfiction, uh, be, but not a book. I think I'm going to reserve my uh, the lion's share of my energy for 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 fiction. If I'm going to write a book, I'll make it fiction. Um, but it's nice to have something that's uh, got a quicker turnaround uh, because you can have the satisfaction of actually getting something done, you know, getting paid for it. Uh, it it's nice when that happens on a shorter loop than, uh, you know, waiting seven years uh, to, uh, to complete something. And it keeps yeah. you sane. Yeah. Um, you're currently living in California? You're yes, I am. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do you love about California? I know Californians love to love to talk about California, but what do, what, what do you like about California? You know, when I came in off the freeway, uh, it, it's, it's kind of happenstantial that I'm staying in Pasadena. I, I just had come from Kentucky. And when I came in off the freeway, I saw the San Bernardino Mountains and um, I was beat. I'd been driving for a couple of days straight. And I thought, wow, what a majestic view. And I really, I love the weather more than anything. The weather and the mountains don't hurt. Yeah, um, my wife is uh, from Southern California. She grew up in San Diego and we w were on a plane for the first time, you know, in a, in a couple of years this, this summer, we went out to uh, San Diego to the Hotel Del Coronado uh, because, you know, being a writer nerd, I'd read uh, in Henry James's journals that he stayed at the Hotel uh, Del Coronado and I don't know, 1900, it might even been slightly early. And he said that the, the light of Southern California is the only light that you can compare to Italian light, uh, which uh, I find to be true. I think there is something about the light out there that's uh, you know, so unusual. Yeah, I think you. I think that seems true to me too. I I had no idea about Henry James and the Hotel Del Coronado, though. Yeah, San Diego has all of these, you know, strange figures who wand up there. The Hotel Del Coronado too is uh, Frank Baum, you know, the writer of The Wizard of Oz. Uh, supposedly, he bases the Emerald City upon the architecture of uh, the Hotel uh, Del. That he's he's staying at it while he's writing the while he's writing the book. Um, well, yeah. Now that you mention it, I can kind of see that. Yeah. Do you feel, in, and maybe that brings us to a question, do you feel as if places give you energy or give the work a different sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, mentality or however you want to describe it? Yeah, I, I definitely think that a place can energize uh, uh, you, the work. Uh, it did for me uh, with prep in a very big way. Um, I. I, and, and there, but um, yeah, that can definitely happen. I mean, I guess if you feel, um, I, I don't know, there's different, there are a million different ways that a geographic setting can, 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 can work on you. It may be that you were there years ago and so it means something, or it could just be that you find the, uh, the, the terrain, um, uh, it does something for you. I mean, I guess I like mountains because um, I, I lived in New York as a kid and it kind of feels like you're in a Canyon with the big tall building. So I, I yeah. maybe that's why I like the terrain out here. Oh, cool. You'll have to come to West Virginia. You'll, ha you'll have to come and spend some time with us. <laughs> I, I want to, I, I, I drove through West Virginia a fair amount when I was in Kentucky going back and forth to the, um, to the Northeast, but uh, yeah. I never really had anyone to stay with. So I'm coming. Yeah. We have a guest room. You can, you can, uh, there was a bullet hole that was shot through it, though, about a month ago, but it's safe now, I believe. I don't think the odds are that another one, another one will be shot through. I, I've heard about you guys with the uh, the, the, the feuding, but uh, I still I appreciate the offer and I would love to visit you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, Atticus Lish, uh, Scott McClanahan, thank you so, so much for joining us this evening on At Home with Literati. Um, and thank you for this wonderful conversation uh, of viewer rights in. Uh, and yeah, thank you. We hope to have you both uh, in the store in the not too distant future when we're back to doing in-person events. And I'm not using this fake virtual background, but you, it's your actual backdrop for reading to our uh, customers. But uh, until then, we hope you continue to stay safe and be well. And to all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us as well. We look forward to seeing you at the next event. Have a great night, everybody. Take care. All right. Thank you. See you guys later. Thank you. Bye.